The restoration of the Jews to their land took place 450 years before Jesus Christ came into the world. <clears throat> the ten northern tribes who had rebelled after the death of Solomon filled their cup of iniquity to the point where they were carried away by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. Those were the ten northern tribes, and that left only two tribes in the south, Benjamin and, Benjamin and Judah, who comprised the kingdom of Judah. Judah had good kings, but iniquity eventually overtook that kingdom as well. And God sent Nebuchadnezzar's Chaldean armies against them as punishment. <coughs> and <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar destroyed their city, Jerusalem. He raised the temple that Solomon had built and carried Judah into captivity. The northern kingdom was gone forever. And now Judah had ceased to exist as a kingdom. And the land was desolate. But God did not forget his people, <clears throat> the people, the very people he had punished for their iniquities. And uh, the time would come again when he would restore them to their land. <clears throat> Abraham was the recipient of three basic promises from God that, and growing out of those promises were, of course, the prophecies of the Old Testament. Brother Foy Wallace says there are three sections to these Old Testament promises concerning Israel. The promises and prophecies of the Old Testament will classify under one of three heads. The land promised to Abraham and his seed after him, the restoration promise, and the spiritual promise. First, the land promise was fulfilled in Joshua. That's the land promise of Genesis 15:8. And it was fulfilled in Joshua. Deuteronomy 1, 7, 8 says they possessed it. Joshua 24 says they, 21 says they possessed all of it. Second, the restoration promise was fulfilled in the decree of Cyrus. Now here's where millennialism gets uh, way off the track. Uh, off the track anyway, but now they get way off the track because they say, well, God will, God will restore the Jews to that land at the end of the world, and then Jesus will come back and reign a thousand years, which just isn't so. I always like Brother Foy Wallace's definition of premillennialism. He said pre means before, millennial means a thousand, and ism means it ain't so. And so millennialism, or premillennialism, whatever you want to call it, they say God will restore the Jews to the land. God has already done that. That was finished. It was done. It was done 450 years before Jesus Christ came into the world. And that was fulfilled in the decree of Cyrus, king of Persia, who said the Jews could go back to their land. That's in uh, 2 Chronicles 36, 20 through 23. Third, the, the, the third promise is that spiritual promise, of course, that God made to Abraham that's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. God said, I'll make of thee a great nation, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And Paul said in Galatians 3.8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. And so those are the three promises. The promise, the, the land promise fulfilled in Joshua, the Restoration promise fulfilled in the decree of Cyrus. Spiritual promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Growing out of that land promise then were the prophecies assuring them of their restoration to the land following their captivity in Babylon and Persia. You know, they weren't in Babylonian captivity all that time. We always say that. They came out of Babylonian captivity, but they were in Persian captivity. The Persians had defeated the Babylonians. They started in, Babyl in Babylonian captivity and ended in Persian captivity. <clears throat> and uh, assuring them of their return were uh, some promises some, uh, or some prophets of the Old Testament. One of those was Jeremiah who witnessed destru the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in uh, 625 BC. Jeremiah prophesied they would be restored to their land in Jeremiah 25, 11 through 13. 
Ezekiel prophesied during the captivity and he offered the hope of restoration to the Jews while they were languishing in Babylon. And his vision in the Valley of Dry Bones was prophetic of their resurrection from captivity. That's found in Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14. The third prophet who prophesied of the Jews' restoration to their land was Isaiah. He not only foretold that they would be restored to their land, but he named the very king who would issue the decree, Cyrus. And he did that 140 years before the temple was ever destroyed by the Chaldeans, and approximately 210 years before Cyrus issued his decree, allowing the Jews to return in 536 B.C. And so... <clears throat> Every promise that God made to Abraham concerning that land has been fulfilled. And the restoration of the Jews to the land of Judah is our focus this morning. The books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther chronicle the return of the Jews from captivity during the time of their restoration. Their restoration was accomplished over a period of about 100 years with three waves of returnees who were led by Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And each of these leaders represented a component of the Jews' life and the Jews' existence as the people of God. Zerubbabel led the first group back after the decree of Cyrus with the purpose of restoring the temple, which was, of course, the center of their Actually, that was the center of the Jews' existence. The temple represented God's dwelling place among them. It was where he had placed his name. It was their central place of worship. So that was the first thing that was restored. Then, uh, following that, uh, Nehemiah and Ezra led groups. Nehemiah, a group to restore the walls of Jerusalem, their holy city. And Ezra led a group back, and Ezra restored the law of Moses in the life of the children of Israel. And that century-long migration back to their homeland was begun by the decree of Cyrus. I have in the, in the book, there is a timeline that I borrowed from Brother Gary Summers, uh, which he had in his... Uh, lecture uh, in the Denton Lectureship book, a timeline of the returns uh, in, during that restoration. Uh, so I won't go into that here, but you can, you can look at that in the book. First of all, the return under Zerubbabel and Jeshua took place in 536 B.C. In this first wave, about 50,000 Jews returned to their land. That's in Ezra 1, 5 through 2, 64. Before these people lay a formidable task, they returned to a land that was just desolate. Their city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. It was a formidable task simply to rebuild the temple, to restore the temple, and uh, they undertook that task. The first thing they did, of course, was restore their worship. And they offered sacrifices as the law of Moses required. And that's found in Ezra 3, 1 through 6. Then they laid the temple's foundation in Ezra 3, 8 through 13. But God's people in their work then, as now, had adversaries who were determined to stop the work of the Lord. Those adversaries of the Jews at that time, uh, they were the mongrel race of the Samaritans. They uh, carried on a form of worship in Samaria, which had been borrowed in part from uh, the law of Moses, and uh, had been corrupted, and they uh, had established their own place of worship. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> they were like denominations and apostate churches of Christ today. They took God's law 
and changed it and amended it and adapted it to suit their own tastes and they intoned today's denominational mantra <clears throat> that is as ancient as they are. You know what they said? Let us build with you. Let us build with you. For we seek your God as ye do. Don't we hear that today even from, from Islam that says, Oh, we all have the same God. Allah is, you call him Jehovah, we call him Allah. Allah is not Jehovah, and Jehovah is not Allah. Allah is a concoction of man. He was the moon god of many gods that the Arabians worshipped. Mohammed just picked him out and said, we're just going to make him the one god. He's going to be the only one. And then Mohammed made up his own religion. <clears throat> we seek your god as ye do. Denominations today will go, well, we believe in the same god. We believe in Jesus Christ. They may believe in Christ. They don't believe Christ. If they did, they'd obey Him. And so, that's the thing that people say today. And that's as old as these Samaritans who came to the Jews and said, well, let, let's help you. We're, we seek your God as you do. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua knew they could have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But rather, reprove them, as Paul said in Ephesians 5.11. Unlike those who signed a letter supporting Apologetics Press, Dave Miller, and by extension his error of elder reevaluation and reaffirmation, Zerubbabel and Jeshua rebuked the Samaritans, saying, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves, together, we will build unto the Lord God of Israel. Ezra 4, 4. Their refusal, then, to enter into fellowship with the Samaritans angered the Samaritans. And I'm sure that there may have been some lectureship up in Samaria where they videoed some questions about these people and one of those Samaritans may have got up and said well those people are vile those are vile people we want to build with you no you can't then what's the reaction well then we hate you if you're not going to step in line with us we're going to hate you and we're going to do everything we can to oppose you and so their refusal angered the Samaritans and that resulted in a letter of false accusations against the Jews from the Samaritans to King Artaxerxes. And as a result of that letter, the king halted the work on the temple. And for three years, it languished, unfinished, until the prophets Haggai and Zechariah stirred the people again to action. This brought more opposition. But now Darius, who was king, searched his archives and he found that decree of Cyrus that permitted them to go back and build their temple and he gave permission for the work to proceed so at last it was finished. Now, in a chronological study of the Jews' restoration to their land at this point, <clears throat> at the end of chapter 6 is chronologically where the book of Esther takes place. The book of Esther fits between the, the uh, end of Ezra 6 and then it comes, uh, you look at the book of Esther and then you come back to Ezra 7 and you're still in chronological order. Esther, the book of Esther is a, is a great book on the providence of God. The name of God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And yet, he's there in every page. His providence. 
things that God does behind the scenes that we don't know about. People say, oh, this was the providence of God. You don't know that. I don't know that. I can only say with Mordecai, who knoweth? Who knoweth? The providence of God is not something that we can know for sure. God doesn't, unless God tells us. As he told Paul on the voyage to Rome, when Paul told those people on the ship, he said, the angel of the Lord stood by me and said, nobody will perish, but you have to remain in the ship. That was the providence of God that drove them across the Mediterranean in that storm to the island of Melita. That was God's providence that preserved them in that storm. How do we know? God told Paul. But until God tells us, we don't know that's the providence of God. But Esther saved her people in the providence of God. And so, God ruled then, and He still rules in the kingdoms of men through His providence. And that couldn't be made clearer than in the book of Esther, a Persian, or, or a Jewish queen of Persia, who saved her people. Now, at this point, people say, well, what was Esther and her family doing still in there? Why, why did they stay? Well, the answer is that not all Jews returned. Not all of them returned. Cyrus understood that in his decree when he said, whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him. He knew not everybody would return. So, it's a good thing for the Jews that Esther didn't return the providence of God. Then there was the return under Ezra. That was in 457 B.C. After the events chronicled in Esther, Ezra the scribe leads a contingent of Jews back to Judah. Their journey took four months, Ezra chapter 7, verse 8. And when Ezra arrived, he learned the other returnees hadn't completely separated themselves from the heathen inhabitants, but had done as their, their fathers had that resulted in their being carried away in the first place. They'd intermarried with a lot of heathen uh, women. Ezra rent his garment, his mantle, plucked his beard, his hair, sat down in the evening, sacrificed when, uh, until the evening sacrifice when the people had gathered. He stood, spread his hands unto God, and prayed a fervent prayer of confession, enumerating Israel's sins in Ezra 9. And in the wake of his prayer, the people demonstrated true repentance and put away their foreign wives and children. Nobody argued. Well, if we obey this law, this will place the children in an untenable position. As some people argue today. Nobody said, Ezra, you can't break up a home. Ezra said, ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord your God and do his pleasure. Separate yourselves from the people of the land from strange wives. Ezra 10 Verses 10 and 11, and the people did not protest Ezra's command. <clears throat> they only requested that this matter be taken care of in an orderly manner. Ezra agreed, and the process of separation took place immediately. While God today does not demand that Christians marry only Christians, He does have a law of marriage that says one man and one woman are to marry for life. One man and one woman. That's something our government can't figure out. That's something that the presumed president cannot figure out. That's something that uh, these federal judges cannot figure out. They're just plain stupid. God said one man and one woman, not two men, not two women. A federal judge in Oklahoma said, or of Oklahoma's law, we voted 70% of our people voted to ban what they call same-sex marriage, which is a laughable statement anyway. 70%. 
Seven out of ten people in Oklahoma who voted, voted to ban that. And a federal judge comes along and says, oh, that's unconstitutional. Can you imagine what our, what our founders, what James Madison, the father of our Constitution, would say today if they could come back and hear these judges say, you have a constitutional right to commit sodomy. That's what they're saying. And all they're saying is, we're going to give you a right to engage in licentiousness. The founders of this country and the writers of the Constitution would, they, <laughs> they would be flabbergasted. They would say, we didn't write that Constitution to protect that kind of, that kind of stuff. We didn't write that Constitution to protect that. One man and one woman. And the only God-ordained reason for breaking that marriage is fornication. Matthew 19, verses 4 and 5 and 9. That principle laid down in Ezra 10 is just as valid today as it was in Ezra's day. Marriages that are not approved by God must be dissolved if those who are in those marriages want to please God and go to heaven. There's no other alternative. Gospel preachers today cannot ignore unlawful marriages saying, well, they're just too widespread. Or so many in that church are in the situation today. I <laughs> mean, like Noah arguing with God, saying, well, so many people are committing sin that uh, it, it probably shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> In Noah's day. Or they say, well, we just can't ask people to break up their homes. What Ezra said of those Jews in unlawful marriages is as valid today as it was then. If the marriage is unlawful, in the eyes of God, it's got to be dissolved. And that's the message gospel preachers who are faithful will preach. Then there was the Return under Nehemiah in 444 B.C. He was serving as a cupbearer to the Persian king when he learned some disturbing news that uh, the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down, the gates of the city burned. Now, that probably referred to some of the walls which had been rebuilt after the people returned from captivity because, uh, as, uh, one of, as Adam Clark says, uh, it couldn't refer to the walls which are broken down level with the dust by Nebuchadnezzar. For to hear of this could be no news to Nehemiah. He already knew that. So they had been repaired, and yet now they've been broken down again. <clears throat> Nehemiah was heartsick about that. He prayed for favor in the eyes of the king. He would ask permission for him to return so he could <clears throat> repair the walls of Jerusalem. Zerubbabel had and Joshua had restored the temple, the house where in a figure God dwelt among his people. Ezra had restored the law and the people's obedience to its precepts. Now Nehemiah would restore the walls of the city where the temple stood, the city of David, Zion, their holy city. <clears throat> Alone, Nehemiah made a circuit around the city by night to assess the damage and prepared to restore the walls. But Satan doesn't rest in opposing God's people. Remember the opposition that arose in the building of the temple, rebuilding of it? Well, there's more opposition coming. Satan's always there to oppose the people of God. When uh, the, the sons of God come to present themselves before God in Job 2.1, Satan was there. Satan was there. <clears throat> And Nehemiah's work was no exception. Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite, Geshem, the Arabian, got wind of Nehemiah's plans. <clears throat> they laughed with scorn. They said, what are you going to do, rebel against the king? Nehemiah said, the God of heaven, he will prosper us, therefore we, his servants, will arise and build, Nehemiah 2.20. He then added the same kind of rebuke that was given by Zerubbabel, saying, Ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. You're not the people of God. <clears throat> well, 
Well, that was the only the first wave <coughs> of opposition that would that he would meet. As the work continued, the anger of his adversaries, Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabians, the Ammonites, the Ashdodites, their anger was aroused to a fever pitch, and they were determined to attack the Jews to stop that work. Now I want you to think back, and we don't have time to go into this, but you think back at the time of the restoration movement in the late 1700s and through the 1800s in this country. There are a number of parallels there in that restoration and this one that we're talking about this morning. There was opposition. People were, uh, <clears throat> they, they laughed, they made fun of uh, members of the church, called us Campbellites, not many people today know what a Camelite is, do they? Brother Wallace said one time, he said, you know, I kind of miss being called that. It meant we stood for something. <clears throat> and that's true. They made fun of us. They called us Camelites. That didn't work, so they tried something else. <clears throat> they, uh, they tried fighting, which means they were willing to debate. They're not willing to debate anymore. Very few denominationalists will debate anymore. And of course, none of those who claim to be members of the church in all this recent, or as we used to say, they said in the South, the late unpleasantness, uh, they, won't, they won't debate either. In fact, they won't even talk to you. I remember being told, well, you need to go talk to Curtis Cates. Curtis Cates wouldn't talk to anybody. Curtis Cates wouldn't talk to anybody. <coughs> but back in those days, they would debate. They would fight. And that's what happened here. <coughs> they determined to attack the Jews to stop their work. So Nehemiah again prayed. And if you'll notice every time he has opposition, he prays. And uh, he continued to work. Nehemiah 4 9. This idea of, you've heard it, let go and let God was not in Nehemiah's mind. <clears throat> he knew that he should pray as though everything depended on God and to work as though everything depended on him. God grants us strength and courage, but he expects us to keep doing his work on earth. He gives us our daily bread, but he doesn't put it in our mouth. He doesn't bake it for us. He doesn't slice it and put it in our mouth and feed us. <clears throat> We're enjoined to pray and work, and that's what, what Nehemiah did. <clears throat> he put men to work with their tools in one hand and a weapon in another. They were building and defending. <clears throat> and they were ready. Too many in the church today think, well, we can just love them in. Don't say anything that will offend them. You know, that might be offensive. I wouldn't talk that way. You remember when uh, Jesus, Jesus told the Pharisees some things and the disciples came to him. He said, they said, did you know they were offended? Did you know that, that they were offended when they heard that? And, and Jesus, of course, said, Well, I'm so sorry I offended them. I need to run and apologize. No, that's not in the Scriptures. Jesus didn't do that. Well, you know what he said? He said, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead, the blind, they both fall in the ditch. Why didn't you know they were offended? It was the truth. It was the truth. Now, we don't preach things just to offend people. But when you preach the truth, and the preaching the truth in love means to preach the truth with love for God and the truth. Yes, we should love our neighbors as ourselves. Love God and the truth supremely. But preaching the truth in love means loving the truth. Love should motivate us. But it's the gospel that motivates and saves the lost. The sword of the Spirit we should love people and we should build and yet we should wield the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17. You can't just love people in the church. It takes a weapon, the sword of the Spirit. So finally, <clears throat> Nehemiah's enemies saw they couldn't prevail by scorn or mockery or threats of violence. 
So they did what denominations in our day have done. They shifted gears to, from overt proposition or from uh, overt opposition to a proposition. Why don't you come down and sit down with us down here on the plains of Oh No, and we'll talk about this. Let's meet together down here. <clears throat> four times they extended that loving hand of compromise. And four times Nehemiah refused. Nehemiah 6, 1 through 4. The fifth time they came to Nehemiah with an open letter accusing them of rebellion against the king, claiming Nehemiah wanted to be the king. Of course, that letter was as authoritative as whispers across the back fence. They said, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu saith it. You know, so-and-so said. So that makes it official. The wall, though, was finished in 52 days. <clears throat> Scorn, ridicule, threats of violence, finally compromise had not moved Nehemiah. We need to take a lesson in the church today from Nehemiah. He was often, he is often called the greatest patriot in, in Jewish history. He was a great man. We need to take a lesson. There were problems with the people who had family ties. <clears throat> Intermarriage with the enemies of God. Family ties are often the undoing of the faithful. That was the case of the mother, for instance, of that lesbian over in Tennessee. You remember here a while back? Congregation withdrew from that lesbian, and her mother supported her. And, of course, the, the news channels got on and thought that was just so terrible what that church is doing because that woman had been a member of that church for years. <clears throat> Family ties are often the undoing of people. A man who was once an elder in church in Oklahoma told me that his daughter had lived, moved to North Carolina. And he said uh, she had married a member of a denomination and she said he, uh, she attended with him. Said she goes to a Baptist church. And this man was an elder at one time. He said, well, at least she goes to church. Now, that's compromised with the truth. I mean, with error. That's compromised with error. Well, after the wall was finished, Nehemiah went through some final reforms. Among those was men who had, wear, who had married the women of Ashdod. Uh, their children couldn't speak in the Jews' language. It spoke half in the Jews, according to the language of each people. His... His action was swift and de decisive. He did about the same thing Ezra did. He, he uh, cursed and smote them, plucked off their hair, made them swear not to give their daughters or their sons to the heathen. And he reminded them of Solomon's folly in taking strange women to be his wives. Well, <clears throat> the Jews returned, were restored to their land, over a period of about 100 years. That is chronicled in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. And with the close of the book of Nehemiah, the Old Testament historical record came to an end. That's the end of the historical record of the Old Testament. It's the end of Nehemiah. Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi uttered their prophecies during the period of restoration. But no prophetic word, no prophetic voice would again be heard in Israel until four centuries later when one would come into the wilderness of Judea crying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 